All right, chemistry, this is your video lecture for chapter 22, section 1. We're talking about nuclear chemistry. Specifically in this section, we're going to talk about the nucleus itself. Uh, there are two things I'm going to want you to be able to do by the end of this PowerPoint presentation. Explain what a nuclide is and describe the different ways nuclides can be represented. This is something that we went over in chapter 3, so it won't be brand new. I also want you to be able to define and relate the terms mass defect and nuclear binding energy. These are two brand new terms. So you're going to have to strap in and follow along as we cover this, uh, these topics. Uh, these second two objectives are going to be covered in the next video lecture, so I won't go over them right now. I'll go over those at the beginning of next lecture. So we're starting in the nucleus here, starting in the nucleus. Before we talk about nuclear chemistry, we need to understand what the nucleus is. Again, we did cover this in chapter three, but we are going to introduce some new terms because in the field of nuclear chemistry, there are some unique vocabulary terms used. For example, collectively, protons and neutrons are called nucleons. Nucleons, those are items, particles that are found in the nucleus. So they are nucleons. An atom is referred to as a nuclide. The reason that we have a specific term for this within the topic of nuclear chemistry is because we're dealing with atoms as though they're like individual people. They have an individual identity. And so we have this idea of the isotope. So we're going to definitely have to take into account the mass number. Hope you remember the mass number from chapter three. But we're dealing with this atom as though it is a person with its own set of personality traits, or in this case, it would be uh, chemical characteristics. So we have this term nuclide, nuclide. Now an atom, or should I say specifically a, 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 an isotope, is going to be identified by the number of protons and neutrons in its nucleus. We can identify just the atom by the number of protons, but if I want to get real specific and tell you what version of that atom it is, what, uh, what element that is, I need to tell you the mass number, the, which would include the number of neutrons in that nucleus. For example, and here are the two ways that you can represent nuclides that you've already seen. We have, for example, hyphen notation. You've already seen this, radium-228. We see that radium is the element. Okay, We can find radium on the periodic table and by its definition, we can know its atomic number. Just look at the periodic table. But the mass number is given at the end of that hyphen. It's 228. So the combination, the sum of the nucleon, <laughs> nucleons, the nucleons in the nucleus is going to be 228. We can go and use the element symbol notation. We have, again, radium-228 here. But it's radium, capital R, lowercase a, that's the element symbol. Okay, and by definition, radium has 88 protons in the nucleus. That's the atomic number, 88. And uh, 228 is the mass number. And notice that we're writing the mass number as a superscript and the atomic number as a subscript. This format is going to be very, very important when we go on to talk about alpha decay and beta decay, and those different types of emissions that we're going to talk about here. We're going to use this, this uh, symbol format very, very commonly. So we really need to understand what each of these uh, numbers are trying to communicate. All right, on to these two big, bad, scary terms, mass defect and nuclear stability. You might not know this, but if you were to take the sum of the masses of the individual parts of a nucleus, or of an atom in general, meaning if you were to take the sum of all the protons, all the neutrons, and all the electrons in an atom, that would actually not equal the mass of the atom as a whole. The mass of the atom is actually going to be a little bit less than that. And that doesn't make a whole bunch of sense, right? The atom should equal the sum of its parts. That's actually not the case. The atom in real life actually has a slightly smaller mass. And that difference between what you think the atom should be and what it actually has a mass of is called the mass defect. It's a mass defect. For example, let's look at helium here. We got helium-4. 
right? Helium has two protons by definition. This particular isotope of helium has two neutrons as well. So it's helium-4. When we measure a single atom of helium-4, it has a mass of 4.002602 AMU. Fair enough. But if I were to add all the masses of the protons, neutrons, and electrons in this helium atom, it should equal 4.032979 AMU. That's not what we measured. We actually measured a number that's smaller than that, a mass smaller than that. In fact, it's 0 0.030377 AM, AMU less than what we should see, or quote unquote should see. This is the mass defect. Okay, that 0 0.030377 AMU, that's the mass defect. So remember that idea, mass defect. We're going to transition to nuclear binding energy, but first we've got to talk about Albert Einstein, pretty important character in history. You guys have heard of this equation as well, E equals mc squared. According to this equation, mass can be converted into energy and energy into mass. Okay, this, uh, this claims an equivalency between the two. Now, one thing I want to point out when it comes to doing calculations with this equation, which you guys will have to do, C is equal to the speed of light. And the speed of light is a constant. It's not going to change here. So realistically, there are only two terms in this equation that can change, energy and mass. And what we're going to give you, or I'm going to give you for some of these sample problems, is I'm going to give you the mass defect which is the M term. So since you are, will already know the speed of light because it's a given, it's a constant, I will give you the mass defect. All you have to do is solve for E. That's all you have to do, or vice versa. I could give you E, energy, and you would just have to solve for M, the mass defect. That's all you're gonna have to do. This is actually fairly simple math, as long as you keep your head on straight and don't get intimidated. Now, Moving on to the nuclear binding energy, the nuclear, uh, the nuclear binding energy is the energy that is released when a nucleus is formed from nucleons. And so what we're going to see is that all of those constituent particles, all the protons and the neutrons that come together to form a nucleus, when they do come together to form a nucleus, there is a small bit of mass that is lost teeny tiny bit, a small bit of mass. But according to E equals mc squared, that is a certain amount of energy that is released. So the mass that is lost is actually, it doesn't just disappear, right? It doesn't just vanish. It's actually converted into energy and then released. That is the nuclear binding energy. In general, the nuclear binding energy is a measure of the stability of a nucleus. So what that means in layman's terms, the more or the larger your nuclear binding energy is, the more stable your nucleus is. Total mass of the nucleus is less than the total mass of the protons and neutrons that make it up. This extra mass that is lost when the protons and neutrons combine is attributed to the nuclear binding energy. Remember, Einstein's relation allows us to consider mass and energy as two aspects of the same quantity. When protons and neutrons combine, this energy and its associated mass is released. This process is the source of the energy in fusion reactions. So continue with this nuclear binding energy idea, I'm going to show you one of the calculations you'll have to do, and I'm going to use the example of that helium-4 that we saw in one of the previous slides. Now if you remember, the mass defect from that slide, which you can look at right now, was 0 0.030377 AMU. We are going to plug that number into E equals mc squared, and we're going to truly calculate 
the nuclear binding energy using Einstein's equals mc squared. But here's the problem. In order to get that equation to work, we have to put in a mass in kilograms. If you look at that slide, that mass that was given to us as the mass defect is in AMU. So before we can continue, we're going to have to convert 0 0.030377 AMU into kilograms because the unit kilogram is going to be necessary to actually make that equation work. But that's not that hard. In fact, you guys did this on your secondary worksheet last chapter. So we take this AMU value, this mass in AMU, because that's a mass unit, and we're going to set up a conversion factor that equates AMUs and kilograms. And in the book's definition of atomic mass unit, this value in kilograms is given. This is not a new number for you guys. You guys have seen this number before. And because this is the mass in kilograms that equals 1 AMU, this is a statement of equality. And because it's a, a statement of equality, we can use it to create a conversion factor. Now notice AMU on the conversion factor, it's on the denominator, so that way the AMU will cancel. And so kilogram is my unit that I put on the numerator. Therefore, it is the only unit I have left. All that's left is to plug and chug, calculator work. And you should get an answer of 5.0441 times 10 to the negative 29th kilogram. Is that a very large mass? No, it's incredibly small. But we have it in kilograms. Now we can move on. We can plug this into e equals mc squared. So we can calculate the energy equivalent. Again, according to E equals mc squared, we plug in for m this 5.0441 times 10 to the negative 29th kilograms that we just calculated. The constant that we're going to use for the speed of light is 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters square, or sorry, sorry, meters per second. It's a velocity. But we're going to square that because it's mc squared. Now, the number that you calculate here as a result of your plug and chug calculation, your calculator work, is going to be 4.54 times 10 to the negative 12th. The only thing that could possibly be confusing here is the units. You guys don't really have to know this right now. It's more of a physics thing. But a joule, which is a very common unit for energy, a joule is actually equal to a kilogram times meter squared divided by second squared. And if you look at the E equals mc squared equation, those are the units that we actually have at the end of the calculation. We have kilograms, and then we have meters over seconds, but we're squaring that, so it's meters squared divided by second squared. And so the equation e equals mc squared sets us up to generate a value in joules. So now we have how much energy is released by this mass defect in helium-4, specifically. Now, there's uh, another piece of useful information that we can use when we're talking about that nuclear binding energy. It's the binding energy per nucleon. Now, again, do not be intimidated here. If you could generate the calculation, if you could carry out the calculation we just did, all you have to do now is take that number and then divide it by the total number of nucleons in that nucleus. And that should make a little bit of sense to you because it's the binding energy per nucleon. You simply divide that binding energy by the total number of nucleons you have. In general, Elements with intermediate atomic masses have the greatest binding energies per nucleon and are therefore the most stable. Because remember, the nuclear binding energy is a measure of the stability of the nucleus of an atom. So the larger, the greater that binding energy is, the more stable it's going to be. But it's not just the, uh, the, the absolute total. To be more specific, it's per nucleon. Per nucleon, that's the best indicator of nuclear stability, the higher that binding energy per nucleon. And 
here's how we can see this graphically binding energy per nucleon what I want you to notice here is that we have all these different elements going on all these different isotopes but up here iron 56 iron having an atomic number of 26 is at the is at the top of the hill right here right king of the castle king of the castle iron is very intermediate in terms of its uh, atomic number and mass number it's very intermediate around the middle and it is pretty representative representative of a very very stable nucleus again why does it have a stable nucleus how do we show that well it has the large binding energy per nucleon up here on the y-axis all right that's where we're going to end today's video lecture we will finish up the video lecture for, the video lectures for this uh, section next time we meet. I'll see you next period.